Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. We are so glad that you're here with us today, whether you're in the room or you're joining us online. And we want to say an espe a special welcome to you if it's your first time today. If it's your first time joining us this morning and you're here in the room, we want to invite you after the service as you leave to stop by the table just outside those doors. Our new here team will be happy to meet you. We've got a special gift for you, and we just want to welcome you. If you're worshiping with us online and it's your first time, just let us know in the chat so that our team can reach out to you and, and just say hello and get to know you. For those of you that are online today, today is a communion Sunday. So at the end of the service, toward the end of the service, we'll take communion together. So we want to invite you to grab your elements that you have. Maybe it's some juice, some crackers, some bread, whatever you have on hand will work. But we want you to be able to participate with us. Um, for all of us watching today, I want to make sure that you know that today um, we're going to be talking about sexual ethics. So it is a little bit more of a mature sermon. So kids that are in the room, we're actually going to have them go to their spaces a little bit early today. So that'll be great. But we just want to make sure that you know as you're watching today, either in person or at home, what we'll be talking about. And for those of you in the room, I have one more announcement. Today, we're going to continue to invite you to wear your masks. I know that tomorrow the mask mandate expires in Marion County, but today is today, friends. And so we're going to keep our masks on for this service. Starting next week, masks will be optional. You can read all about it on our website. If you want to know more about the policy, ask one of us pastors afterwards or go check it out online. So with that, I want to invite you to stand as we worship together and Kim Davis and our worship team lead us in song.
we're so grateful that you're here. We're so grateful that you're present. We know that our lives can be challenging sometimes. They can be messy. We can get off track, and sometimes we need help. We need you to come and rescue us, to be present with us, and we need to open our hearts and be with you. Thank you. We're so grateful for that. Would you come to our rescue?
Well, one of my favorite things about gathering and worship together is we get to lift our voices together in song. And in this space, some of those voices belong to our kids. And so kids, we love having you worship with us. It's a great gift to us. And at this time, we wanna invite you to go to your kids' specific spaces. So parents and caregivers, if you've already gotten your kids checked in with their stickers, with their tags, that's great. You can send them with our kids' team at the back of the room. If you haven't and you want to send them to worship with the other kids, Kids, that's okay. Just go with our kids staff and they'll get you all taken care of. And if you're worshiping with us online, remember we have tons of kids resources on our kids ministry page on our website that you can check out. Now, as you, as our kids go to their spaces, as you take your seats, I want to remind you of something that we did last year, about a year ago in 2020. We as a church, our church leadership, we created a new open statement. And this is a statement saying, who we want to be, who God is calling us to become. And so today, I want to invite you to affirm this open statement together. We're going to do that in the form of a sort of responsive reading. And if you've never done one of those, that's okay. I'll say the parts that say leader. You'll say the part that say congregation. So just follow along with me, and let's take a moment to affirm this statement of openness together. So at St. Luke's United Methodist Church, we're an open community of Christians, helping people find and give hope through Jesus Christ, regardless of their gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, nationality, disability, or socioeconomic background. We work to ensure that our congregation and its leadership represent the community in which we are located. We are dedicated to including women, people of color, and LGBTQ+, as staff and in positions of leadership and decision-making. We renounce the way religion has been used throughout history to support racism, war, discrimination, genocide, violence, and poverty. And we pledge to rid ourselves of the conscious and unconscious biases when sacred stories are used to uphold injustice. We are particularly sensitive to the issues facing our brothers and sisters of color and LGBTQ plus individuals, both within the United Methodist Church and in the general society. We pledge to be leaders in eradicating racism and discrimination. You are invited to join us. As John Wesley said, though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike, may we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without all doubt, we may. Herein all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences. So church, this is who we are becoming. Will you join with me in prayer? God, I'm thankful for this place and this people and this commitment that you've called us to. To be people who follow you and who do that in a way that's open and inclusive and desperately seeks justice. God, I pray for us that as we as a church try to live into this commitment that we all just said together, that, Lord, we would be a community that makes space for the things that can be uncomfortable. Jesus, that we would have honest conversations, that we would speak the truth in love, that we would be willing to look inside of ourselves and that we would look to you to become more and more like Christ. Lord, today, as we are continuing our journey in the book of 1 Thessalonians, as we're looking at what Paul has to say about sexual ethics, God, I know that this is a topic that can be heavy and difficult. Some of us are really unsure of how to even approach it. But God, you invite us as your people to come to you with everything every part of our lives. And so I pray that today would be no different. Jesus, I pray for 
for those here who have experienced deep hurt and pain and grief in this area of their lives. God, I pray for those here who need your grace and restoration. I pray for those who need your guidance. And God, I pray for those who, because of their identity, because of their sexual orientation have been excluded, I pray that this would be a place of home and of love and of just being known as your beloved child. God, that's who we are. We are deeply loved and known by you. And we're so grateful. So God, give us the clarity to accept that grace and truth today and be with us as we continue our worship. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to invite us to continue our worship today by seeing ways that you can continue to connect here in community at St. Luke's. So take a look at our announcement video now. Good morning. My name is Willie, and I'm happy to welcome you to worship at St. Luke's. If you're watching online or on Facebook, let us know you're here by clicking on the Connect and Attendance links. If you're here in person, just scan the QR code on the Stay Connected card in the pew back to record your attendance. Make sure that you also mark anyone in your household who is here with you or watching online with you. By letting us know you're here, we're able to help you take your next step at St. Luke's and share upcoming opportunities. There are a ton of ways to connect at St. Luke's this summer, and we kick it all off this Wednesday with our all-church party in the parking lot. We'll have food trucks and the lip-sync battle of the century between our pastors. Proceeds from the event will provide supplies to local schools. If that isn't sweet enough for you, the Kona Ice Truck will be here so you can enjoy some shaved ice while watching the fun. No registration is needed. All you have to do is show up. Throughout June, July, and August, we'll also be hosting over a dozen book studies right here at St. Luke's and in homes around the Indy area. Whether you're looking to form relationships or want to dive deeper into topics that interest you, we hope you'll join us for one of these great studies. Learn more and sign up at stlukesumc.com slash groupfinder. And finally, today we want you to know about a church-wide effort to end gun violence. As a Christian community, Jesus calls us to be peacemakers and to prevent violence. One way we're doing this is through a letter writing campaign. If you're watching online, go to stlukesumc.com slash ccj for details on how you can support this effort. If you're here in person, stop by one of the tables outside of the worship spaces to write a letter or postcard, and St. Luke's will mail it for you. Thanks again for joining us today. We are thrilled to have you be a part of our open, affirming, anti-racist church where you are loved and accepted for exactly who you are. Well, as we continue our worship today, I want to invite you into a time when we get to give back from all that God has given us. And as you give, I want you to know what a difference your giving makes. A portion of every dollar that you give actually goes beyond our church, into the community, to our partner ministries. And one example of these partner ministries that we get to support is Family Promise. Together, we've raised over $200,000 to help ensure that homeless individuals will have housing through 2021. So as you consider giving today, there's a few different ways that you can do that. You can give through our website, you can text to give, you can send your check into the church office, or if you're worshiping here in person, you can drop your gift off as you leave in the little box outside of this room. But no matter how you give, know that we're grateful and know that it really is making an impact here at St. Luke's and beyond our walls. Now, the final thing I wanna share with you today is a celebration of our baptisms. If you were worshiping with us before COVID, you know that in this space, we would do baptisms in person, we'd have babies, we'd walk into the aisle. It was a beautiful celebration of God's grace and love. But during COVID, we've had to get a little bit creative and do these things outside of this space. And so we like to bring those to you in video form so that we can still celebrate as a church community. So take a look at some of the baptisms we've done recently. I 
want to invite you to join me in celebrating some families here at St. Luke's whose children were recently baptized. In May, we held two socially distant ceremonies here in the sanctuary for six candidates for baptism. Brittany and Logan Mann presented their daughter, Mackenzie Rebecca Mann. Catherine and Evan Armington presented their daughter, Catherine Constance Armington. Shannon and Matthew Brannick presented their daughter, Davina June Brannick. Leslie and Nick Rising presented their son, Jack Cooper Rising. Bryn and Grayson Swaim presented their daughter, Lainey Grace Swaim. Andy and Terry Malcolm presented their daughter, Charlotte Ann Malcolm. What a monumental moment in the lives of these children and their families. We're so proud of all of them. If you see them or think of them, be sure to extend your congratulations. And if you are interested in exploring baptism for yourself or your child, we have another baptism class coming up on June 27th from 12.30 to 1.45 on Zoom. You can register at stlukesumc.com slash baptism. Our scripture reading today is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you learned from us how you ought to live and to please God, as in fact you are doing, you should do, more, do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication, that each one of you know how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, just as we have already told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God did not call us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever rejects this rejects not human authority, but God, who also gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As a reminder from my Friday email, uh, this is kind of a PG-13 message today. We're talking about sexual ethics. So if you've got small children who are around, I want you to be aware of that. Uh, you know, either wait and come back to the sermon, maybe have some activities that they can do in another room. But typically when the church <laughs> ventures into the bedroom, it's not a good result. Think about the story of the religious leaders who brought to Jesus a woman caught in adultery. Now, how did they catch her? Where had they been? What were they doing there? <laughs> no, religion and sex is usually more volatile than religion and politics. So, <laughs> if you're at all uncomfortable with the topic today, I really am. I feel a bit like the pastor who served a church in a lake community, and every summer the attendance just plummeted because people went water skiing. So he was lamenting to his wife how he wanted to, to try to preach a sermon to get people to be in church. He's going to preach about water skiing. She begged him not to, but he was insistent. So that Sunday she said, I'm going to stay home today. Well, driving to the church, the pastor had a change of heart. He thought, you know, the people there don't deserve to hear me rail against the ones who aren't there. So he reached in a satchel, pulled out an old sermon on sexual morality. Well, because he didn't have a lot of time to prepare, his delivery was a little awkward and clumsy. And a few days later, 
a woman in the church was with the pastor's wife. She said, what did you think of your husband's sermon Sunday? The woman said, well, to be honest with you, I told him he shouldn't preach that sermon. The man just doesn't know what he's talking about. He has only tried twice in his life, once before he got married and then with me, and he fell off both times. <laughs> you see, you don't even have to wait till the end of the sermon to determine whether or not I should be talking about this topic today. <laughs> but whether or not we're comfortable with sexual ethics being addressed in the pulpit. We don't have to look far in our world to see that it definitely needs to be talked about. We continue to see in our society people who struggle to understand and accept people for their sexual identities. We continue to hear about sex crimes like those in the National Women's Gymnastic Program and in universities around our country and the damage they've done. Here at St. Luke's, we want to make sure that our children are, are protected from predators and at the same time struggle with how we can be in ministry to and with people who have been sex offenders. And all of this in a time when availability of pornographic material is at an all-time high. Or maybe I should say low. So perhaps we might follow the example of the Apostle Paul. Like or dislike what Paul says, you have to admit that he doesn't let awkwardness or fear of offending people keep him from addressing a sensitive topic. In fact, I find when people don't like something Paul says, it's usually the fact that they don't like how somebody has interpreted what Paul says, not what Paul actually says. So today, I want us to look at what Paul says to the Thessalonians about sexual ethics. And I believe we will find his words not only sensible and pragmatic, but relative and helpful to our own time today. So we're in a part of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians now in which Paul starts to deal with issues of everyday living and behavior. Most of Paul's letters do this. And last week we made this turn when we looked at the verse in the first part of chapter 4, where Paul says, Finally, my dear friends, since you belong to the Lord Jesus, we beg and urge you to live as we taught you. Paul is writing as a pastor. He wants people to understand how the Christian faith applies to the everyday issues of their lives. So the first issue he deals with, with the Thessalonians, is sexual ethics. Why is that? Is it because sexual misconduct was rampant in the church? Probably not. Probably not. More likely, it's because of what Paul saw going on in the culture of his time. In Thessalonica, there were mystery religions. These, these were like secret knowledge societies. Many of them practiced strange rituals. Some of them practiced sexual orgies. Remember, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians from Corinth, where there was the renowned temple of Aphrodite, which housed 1,000 male and female prostitutes. These people were sex slaves, and many of them were young teenagers and children. This outraged Paul. And it's also the reason why we have to be careful in interpreting other places in the New Testament where Paul talks about 
homosexuality. Remember, that word, homosexuality, has only been around in the English language since the mid-1800s. When we take what is a fairly modern word that we understand means same-sex attraction and apply it to ancient Greek words Paul is talking about, we miss what Paul is reacting to. Paul, in many cases, is addressing sexual abuse, exploitation, men abusing boys. So when people today say, oh, the Bible's clear, Paul condemned homosexuality, we can actually be missing what Paul actually condemned. Several years ago, I prepared a DVD resource for the United Methodist Church called Faithful and Inclusive, in which I look at the many troubling passages in the Bible that seem to shun homosexuality and help us understand this. This is available in our bookstore, so if you want to dig deeper into this topic, please take a look at this resource. Today, let's understand that a lot of the source of Paul's outrage had to do with the values of Roman culture. Roman society believed that people of privilege could do with people of less honorable standing as they please. In a recent sermon by Adam Hamilton, he references Kyle Harper, Oklahoma University professor of history and literature, who says Roman culture had an almost unbelievably callous set of attitudes towards those without social honor, slaves, prostitutes, the poor. Systemic exploitation was built into the social and moral order of the Roman world. The Roman order was constructed on the degradation of the bodies of non-persons. Could that be said today? No wonder... Paul wrote these words to them. For this is the will of God, that each one of you know how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. That was the issue for Paul, exploitation. And he says this angers God. You know, sex, sexual exploitation is an issue in our world today. How angry do you believe God gets at some of these statistics? Roughly 25 million people worldwide today are trafficked for slavery. Nearly 5 million are sexually exploited. 27% are children and two-thirds girls. Commercial sexual exploitation is a 100 billion dollar a year industry and many people caught up in human trafficking are used for pornography when people mainly men say that use of pornography isn't hurting anybody think again in one study it was under it was found that in nine countries people who had been sexually trafficked were done so, 49%, half of them, were done so for purposes of pornography. Pornography itself is an industry with an annual revenue greater than the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball combined. Over 40 million Americans regularly visit porn sites. 47% of families in the U.S. say pornography is a problem. Several years ago, I was traveling on I-70 through Missouri, and I stopped at a place to uh, fill up, and as I was there pumping gas in the car, this old beat-up station wagon pulled up beside me, and this rather large, kind of gruff-looking guy got out, walked inside. It was, it was an old car, and there were lots of clothes and luggage in the car, but then I noticed a young girl in the back seat. She looked to be Hispanic, maybe Uh, six or seven years old but what I really noticed was she looked scared she looked frightened I finished pumping gas got in the car got back on the interstate and then all of a sudden the weirdest feeling hit me like what I just saw was wrong I saw something that that whole picture was terribly wrong 
Paul writes to the Thessalonians to say this issue of letting our desires, letting our urges turn other people into objects that hurts and wounds others has to stop. Not only can we not participate in it, we have to do something about it. And the same is true today. If you're somebody who has struggled with pornography, I hope you will go to our resource page for today's message. We've provided this for each of the Sundays in the series. Just go to our website, stlukesumc.com backslash Everyday Hope. And for today, there's information about pornography and treatment and help that we can get for it. And then I hope everybody right now will write down the phone number that you see at the bottom of the screen. This is a national hotline. We're to call this number if ever we see something suspicious in the way of human trafficking, like I saw in Missouri. Ever since that time, I have kept this number so that when I come upon something, I can call it. 1-888-373-7888. 888-373-7888. I hope you'll keep that number with you. But Paul's discussion of sexual ethics is not limited to social ills. Paul also brings it into the personal realm and he talks about our own behaviors. Before he ever talks about sexual exploitation, listen to what he wrote. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. Sanctification is the process of becoming holy. That doesn't mean self-righteous. It's about transformation, allowing our character to be transformed by the character of God. Paul says this is God's will for you to become more like God, more like the character of God. And reflecting that character has to do with keeping our sexual practices within a covenant marriage relationship, and this is where the sermon gets preachy, right? This is where people say, mind your own business. If what I'm doing in my life is not hurting anybody, you don't have any right nor need to talk about it. But let's hear Paul out. Let's allow Paul to make his case for a Christian sexual ethic. In one regard, it makes practical health sense. Keeping, marriage re- or keeping sexual activity restricted to marriage limits the spread of sexually transmitted diseases. The Center for Disease Control says that this year, STDs will be reported new cases of them over 20 million, and half of those will be from people ages 15 to 24. Now, some people would say, okay then, as long as I'm practicing safe sex, then it doesn't matter. And Paul would say, it's not just a physical issue. It's an emotional one. It's a spiritual one. Paul connects sexual activity, sexual expression with the character of God. And the chief determiner of the character of God is love. And that love is agape. Agape is different from eros, another Greek word for love. That describes erotic love. It's different from philio, another Greek word that describes the love of friends. That's where Philadelphia gets its name, city of brotherly love. Agape is an even higher form. It is a selfless love, a love that puts the other person first. Eric Fromm was a world-renowned psychoanalyst. Years ago, he wrote a book called The Art of Loving. And in it, he said, most people 
see the problem of love as that of being loved rather than of loving, of one's capacity to love. He uses as an example the story of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed God, acted in self-interest, and ate fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes were open. They became aware, and they saw each other and were ashamed. Now, Eric Fromm says, in our modern prudish way of interpreting this, we believe that that means they saw each other unclothed, and now all of a sudden they're ashamed. He says, but that doesn't really make sense. That's kind of silly. They already had seen each other in this way. Rather, he points out that their awareness is now of the fact that they're different people and their shame is they had not yet learned to love each other. And that's what they were made for. They weren't simply made with animal impulses and drives. They're made with the capacity to love as God loves, an agape kind of love that puts the other person first. And when we act in self-interest, we, we lose that capacity. The rest of the Bible is an example of real people and real stories whose sexual behavior allows them to wound or be wounded by others. And God's desire for us is so much different. God wants us to be happy and to be fulfilled, particularly in this area of life. Look at how God created Adam and Eve, according to the Bible. Then the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper as his partner. Now, whenever I meet with brides and grooms to plan their their wedding service and ask if they have any scriptures they'd like to use, they, and by they I often mean the brides, will say, Just don't use that passage that talks about my being a helper. (laughs) We're going to have a marriage of equality. I'm not a helper. And I use that as a chance to do a little Bible study, which couples always love that. (laughs) I point out that the Hebrew word for helper is ezer, E-Z-E-R. It doesn't literally mean helper. It really means somebody of strength giving strength to a weaker one. In this case, it means that Eve is created to help Adam who needs help. That's the way God loves us. God loves us as the divine easer who gives strength to us who need help. And in the marriage relationship, God calls two people into a very unique union and calls them to be for each other what no one else, no one else is meant to be, a relationship where they bring their mutual strengths so that both parties can be made stronger and better. And sexual behavior becomes an expression of that desire to lift up another. You know, this is true in all relationships, straight or gay. St. Luke's is an open community that welcomes everybody, but this value applies to everybody. God intends for this relationship to be understood in one of fidelity and covenant, commitment, trust, where we sort of become God's representative to share agape love. So someone might say, what do I do when I'm in a marriage and I'm the one who's practicing agape love? but my spouse isn't. I'm the only one giving. The other person's taking. 
How long do I stay in that relationship? That's not an easy one. I don't believe that God ever calls us to stay in a marriage that robs us of joy and happiness. And I really believe God does not call us to stay in a marriage that is dangerous, where we're being abused, or we're living in the threat of harm. But at the same time, we do have to understand that marriage does require effort. It does require work. It does require sacrifice. It doesn't always come easy. But if two parties are willing to work at that, they can discover the kind of joy God intends for us. When I was in my first church, I was single. And everybody in the congregation, it seemed, was not just a generation, but two generations older than me. And I remember after about a year, I was so terribly lonely. I went to the pastor of the first United Methodist Church in the county seat town, a really wise man named Dr. George Thompson. We had lunch, and I just kind of poured out my heart to him. And I said, you know, Dr. Thompson, if, if this is what ministry is like, I don't know that I can do it. I don't think I can do this the rest of my life if it's this hard. And he listened to me, and then he, he said words I'll never forget. He said, you know, my call to ministry is a lot like my marriage. There are just some days I wake up and I think, I don't feel like being married today. <laughs> he said, but my marriage is based on something much bigger than the way I feel any given day. And then he said this to me, just like you give a lot of time deciding whether to enter ministry, you must give a lot of time deciding before you leave it. But the key is this, understanding that you're not by yourself. Just like marriage, you say the vows at the altar to remember that God is in it with you. That's why marriage is important. It's not just a piece of paper. It's two people who love each other enough to say, let's ask God to help us. Now, we were talking about ministry. But I've never forgotten his words about marriage. Last week, Susan and I celebrated our 30th anniversary and it's hard to believe it's been three decades. And honestly, I feel like a novice. I, I feel like I get things wrong more than I get them right. But this much I've learned. I've learned that when I put my needs first and I get frustrated with Susan for not meeting my needs, I'm not only miserable, we're both miserable. But when I put her needs first, and I focus on blessing her. She not only is happier, but she has a greater desire to meet my needs. And we're both fulfilled. I believe that pleases God. And when we love in such a way, we discover pleasure for ourselves. So, let me close by talking to a few groups in particular. Some of you listening right now might have been unfaithful in your marriage, and it causes you a lot of remorse. Some of you may have been sexually active in your lifetime, and it and you look back and it gives you so much regret. Some of you may have been involved in pornography and it fills you with tremendous shame. And all of these things make you wonder, does, does God love me? Does God really forgive me? I don't think so. I don't think God can forgive me for these things. To you, I want to say these words. That if you desire to walk in newness of life 
and to please God and to live in harmony with those around you and will admit the things you have done wrong, then hear me now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. God can use a soul that is free of guilt so much more than one who is guilt-ridden and to use a life that becomes full of joy again. And that's what God wants for us and for all of us in a marriage relationship. God wants to use us to love that other person to whom God has called us to love, just like calling some of us into ministry. It's a calling, and we're not alone in it. And God will help us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as we hear that message from Pastor Rob, we're invited now to come together at the communion table. This sacrament that Jesus instituted with his very first followers. And I just want to say to you and to those who might be watching, so many of us need to be reminded that the way we practice our faith is first and foremost about God's grace. And so at this table, God's grace is on full display. Christ came into the world and loved us so much to give his life. We'd be forgiven, we'd be set free, that a new way of living might be possible. And so today, as we gather, as we take communion, we're reminded that God's grace is available to each of us and that we're the kind of community that reminds each other of that grace each and every time we gather. So we celebrate how when Christ was with those first followers who themselves were not perfect people, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when they had finished sharing their meal together, Jesus took the cup and blessed it as well, saying, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we're gathered wherever we are with a deep desire to be more closely united to you, that our lives might reflect your love in the world and the way we love one another. So pour out your Holy Spirit now on each of us and on these gifts of bread and juice. May they be for us your body and blood and a symbol of your love. May we be renewed to live that love in the world as we receive it. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you're joining us online, this is the time when we want to invite you to get your elements and you can participate at any point as we sing our next song. For those of you that are worshiping in the room, we're going to do communion in a way that might be a little bit different than we've done since we've returned to worship. We want you to know that all the elements that you'll receive today have been prepared by volunteers wearing gloves and masks. And we'll invite you, as our ushers will come forward, they'll invite you row by row to come up to the front. Pastor Eric will be here, I'll be over here, and we will serve you the communion elements. They'll be stacked in two little cups, juice and a wafer. All the wafers are gluten-free. And you'll be invited to take those back to your seat and to receive those elements whenever you'd like to in the middle of our song. And then once we're done, we'll come back together for one final word as we leave this place.
Well, that is a promise that we can carry with us as we go out from this place of worship and into our lives. That no matter what our stories look like, no matter what we're carrying, God can make beautiful things out of it. And God does. That's who our God is. So as we go today, we especially again want to say a special thanks to those of you that joined us online. And for those of you in the room too, if you want to know more about what we talked about today, we do have some great resources on our website for this sermon series. So make sure to check those out, find ways to dive deeper into what we talked about today. And no matter what you're walking into the rest of the week, remember that God goes with you. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Go in peace. Amen.